I'm an investor, like many of you here, I guess. And uh, to some extent, I'm really excited to learn more on how to invest in these early stage companies from the panel I have next to me. And uh, you may wonder who they are. And uh, I'd like to start off with the guy in the middle, okay. Anders yeah. Hedlund, who has been serving us with um, research from Red Eye in the past, but is now on the other side of the table. He has uh, invested in many early stage companies, exciting such, and learned some tricks on the road he might share with us. Uh, then we have Linda who is representing Karolinska Development, but she has also been out there pitching to us from earlier endeavors like VOC Diagnostics. And finally, we have Christer, who has been in the big pharma industry. He is the guy that all of you companies are trying to win over and buy your projects. That's all the phase twos we have heard about here. You have to pass through Christer. So you have experience from Eli, Lilly, and uh, some other well-known companies. So having said that, let's uh, try to kick off this discussion and talk a little bit about the type of companies we listen to here today. And if you belong to the investor side, you will get offers from Vator and maybe other firms out there trying to get your investments into different projects. And I'd like to ask the panel here a bit, how do you really determine or what, what kind of factors do you have in order to decide which type of investments you, you find investable? Because like us, I guess you are also overwhelmed by many different offers over time. And Linda, you are at KD, so how, how, do you, how do you manage all this of all the companies coming in? Right, so I mean, different investors have different criteria, of course. We have certain criteria for what type of pharma companies, companies we invest in. Um, we like innovation height, first in class uh, type of uh, uh, projects. Uh, we have um, also medtech companies that we invest in, but there we want to see that the companies have come closer to commercial validation, while in pharma companies we can go in early, um, preferably when they start uh, in, in human clinical trials. Um, but then how do you find the best ones? Um, you know, there, there is obviously the clinical, the science, the evidence that you go for, and then you want to have a strong, um, you know, cluster of uh, investors, uh, a syndicate uh, to, to go in with. Can I tag along? Yes. KD? Is that a good well, bet? Yes, that's what we would like to say. And there, I mean, depends you as a priv private individual, you can invest in KD and then your money will, you know, uh, be deployed in our portfolio companies or any new companies that we invest in. Yeah. And yeah. Anders, uh, what about your scope of deselecting or selecting? Yeah, so, so Nolz to be invest, it's run by me and my father. Um, my father is an entrepreneur and uh, industrialist and I'm sort of the the investor and finance guy in, in this uh, team. Um, so it, it creates a really good dynamic actually because where I see risks, he sees opportunities. Uh, so we try to meet there in the middle uh, and try to get along <laughs> actually. Uh, but our focus is we call ourselves generalist investors within healthcare. Um, and, but I basically learned biotech from my years at, at Red Eye. Um, our sweet spot is, is medtech. And there we don't want to really bet on the regulatory or development risk. We want to see uh, commercial validation. And we basically divide that into the market uptake in medtech. It's rather, and we, we want to focus on patient centric approaches in medtech or imaging um, and where the end customer is we we are not too focused on b2b we we focused on products that go directly into the the healthcare so we pay a lot of attention to regulatory 
guidelines and uh, really who the payer is and the payer structure. Uh, and then we have a few other uh, factors that we really uh, scrutinize, such as commercial, commercialization strategy, mainly in the US, partnering strategy, uh, and what we also look a lot uh, uh, on the clinical evidence, of course. So, Christer, your current uh, wind research project, is that something you can pitch to Anders about? <laughs> Would you fit into that it's picture? It's biotech. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, perhaps I could. I, I'm doing more than that, actually, also. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. tell us, from your uh, Eli Lilly and the yeah. big pharma perspective, what does it take for a company like the ones we listen to today? What does it take for you to, to look into these type of opportunities? Well, uh, I would say two or two and a half things that we're looking at. First is, of course, the medical need in one dimension. The other is the probability of what we call technical and regulatory success. And then the, the half or the third is don't touch any substance without a biomarker because they never work. I've learned that the hard way. So all of you without biomarker, you Get know one. where not to go, <laughs> I guess? Yes. <laughs> so you're saying biomarker is crucial for the Absolutely. larger pharma companies? Absolutely. Nowadays it is. So if I'm in one of those um, early innovative companies yep. from this region, without the biomarker, don't bother calling the big pharma? That's pretty much it, yes. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, would you like to share some thoughts regarding what you find is not investable type of ideas, thoughts. We talked about without uh, biomarkers, you will say no. Yeah. Uh, anything else you would like to share with us saying this is not going to work because of that? I haven't come across any th cases or prospects in the Scandinavian region, Scandinavian region which I found uninvestable due to lack of innovation. Uh, we are we are really good at doing all the right steps in the beginning. Uh, Classic is a spin out of the academic universities and uh, really thorough on um, publications and IP and so on. Uh, so, not as an analyst, not as an investor, have I come across where I've sort of. Uh, ditched it in that phase because I find it uninvestable. It's due to other things, I would say. Okay. Anything from KD? No, I mean, it's, I agree that, you know, innovation height is really, really high in Sweden, specifically also the Nordic region. But then there are all of these other criteria that need to be met in terms of, you know, IP protection, competition, uh, but also f you know, f financial stability and having enough funding to, you cannot alone as a, for example, either an angel or a VC investor carry one company through yourself. So there has to be, you know, others that tag along and, and find uh, the company interesting. And th therefore the management, the team has to be strong and able to sell the idea. That brings me to the classic, the, the pitching we listen to quite often is when this early company present to investors and they have this clear exit path. And I'm pretty sure you will have heard about this phase two data. Then we're going to get someone to take up this venture and we're going to get funding through that, that party. How important do you find as investors that to have an exit path to get funded or to be able to join, to, to invest in the companies? How important is it that the company, you know, want, ha, has an exit plan? Yeah. So Linda and I have a different approaches there because I don't care about exit, actually. We are evergreen investors. Uh, so... But we did, a, we did an exit last year, actually, and that was a lot of fun uh, because, because it was sort of transformative for us. Uh, but now, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, in Europe, we talk way too much about exits um, and uh, way too little about building empires and build, build something really lasting and, and huge. 
and that's a, a clear reason why Europe is losing against China and the, the US. Uh, we lack uh, confidence, I would say, and we lack head offices uh, where uh, Big Pharma and Big Medtech is uh, headquartered in Sweden. We, d we had that in the past, we don't have it any longer, which creates a really strange sort of business dynamic and business landscape where it's really dominated by nano and micro uh, companies today. Um, so we need to sort of, yesterday it was two companies basically in Sweden, it was Pharmacia and Astra, and that was not really fun either actually, because none of us would have had a job <laughs> back then. But we, I think we need to sort of have a more, uh, change the market or business dynamic a little bit so it's not only dominated by micro and nano. We also build something lasting in specialty pharma and maybe eventually a new big med tech or big pharma pops up with headquarters in Sweden. And for KD, how important is it that I have an exit plan when I'm pitching my company to you? Well, well for us it's important I think for our shareholders it's important that we also have an exit uh, strategy. I, I understand and I agree that it's you know great also to be, build big companies uh, that stay headquartered and that stay and, and provide to the ecosystem in Sweden. But um, the money has also you know got to come back to us as investors and also you know us being a public company to our investors eventually when we make exits. So I think there. Are you know, both of those aspects need to be provided. Everyone cannot become the, the that large company. So for us, it's important that the founders or the management team of the company has thought of ac exit strategies and actually is interested in discussing different pathways. But we can find, and depending on the situation, develop an exit strategy together with the company. And Christer, for you and your current uh, Wind Research and Oblique, what's your thought about having a clear exit path when you face new investors? Yeah, of course, uh, that, that, that's what we're being asked for. And for the scientists working in the company, it's a bit frustrating. But on the other hand, it's reality. But, you know, an exit can look very different. You know, there are many solutions to it. So I'm not too concerned about it. I mean, if you're working with a, a big pharma, then of course you don't uh, think in terms of exits and, you know, to sell it off and perhaps close down the operation or something like that. But, you know, this is the way it is. But I think in Sweden we have, as has been mentioned, this great opportunity of also IP IPO as an exit strategy, right? And maybe not specifically exit in the beginning, but at least as a way to find, you know, more funding and new funding and, um, yeah, to build maybe a bigger company and empire. And the reason for asking a bit about this is that quite often when I meet the entrepreneurs in these uh, early innovative companies, they really, they really, really want to conquer the world because they have this mission, they have this idea about their molecule or what have you, that they, they, they really believe in it. And then it's kind of like the question is, is it that your mandates forces them to, to start thinking about they must have an exit plan or is it really what they want? That's, that's kind of like my question to the companies out there. Are you yeah. pushing them in that direction? We, by are, we are definitely looking at exit strategies, but we also have companies in our portfolio that are on the stock exchange and that will continue to follow and, and are growing, generating revenues from Mimic <laughs> specifically <laughs> that we'll present later today. But I mean, so, but then in pharma, what happens is that to, to do these really big clinic, clinical trials in phase three, for example, takes a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can be difficult to continue and support them with our funds or, or the syndicate that we have in Sweden with those funds. And so, uh, so yes, and we do push our companies to also think about exit strategies. We often, uh, we often hear that it's always better somewhere else. 
when you're looking for investments. And I, I recall that the early panel today was also into that subject. But is there any thoughts you want to share about that there is the grass is greener somewhere else in terms of finding capital to me as a company? Well, I can start. And of course, it's easier in the US. There is so much more money. Yeah, around there. I mean, right now I'm talking to a VC there that spends like 15 billion Swedish kronas per year in investments. And that's not perceived a very large company. It's more mid-sized. So it's enormous money there. But also I saw a trend during the last couple of years when I was there. I, I, I left US in 2021. And that was, we saw a trend towards big pharma's doing earlier deals than the, those late stage, phase two, phase three, for the very reasons that the, the late stage projects have become so incredibly expensive. So instead of doing one late stage, you could do 20 or 30 earlier stage. And you know, uh, working in big pharma is pretty much like, you know, or have some quite a few similarities with, with biotech when it comes to money. Because whenever I wanted to start something new, the immediate question I got from the CEO and the board was, okay, but what are you willing to give, in, give up in order to do this? So it's not like uh, in big pharma you have limitless quantities of money. It's like here, but on a more grand scale, so to say. So that, that brings me to some sort of risk-reward scenario that you have to face then. Yes. What, and how, how do you deal with that from a big pharma perspective? When you meet you know, 13 on a dozen new companies, yes. entrepreneurial companies, yeah. new innovative companies, yeah. they have these great ideas, yes. and there are many of them. Yes. How do you, how do you deal with this? Well, uh, you, you can afford to take much greater risks when it comes to this uh, probability of technical success. If you see a tremendous, you know, let, let's say a, a gene therapy for ALS, which would be fantastic. Uh, the chances that it will work are probably not that great. But on the other hand, when it works, it becomes so, you know, incredibly big. And that's how they think. Uh, but if you're, you're a smaller investor, I, I guess you can't think like that. You have to be a bit more careful that, you know, uh, you're happy with perhaps a smaller reward, but with a much lower risk. But uh, the big farmers, if you look at, I would say, most of their projects, it's very, very high technical risk. So they are looking for the moonshot type of... Uh, yep. Yep. Events. I mean, if, if you have, let's say, uh, a huge seller like Osempic today or uh, Humira, that's a mixed blessing okay. to have because uh, then you're being asked, okay, what is coming after this? And to repeat Humira is not that straightforward. It's quite difficult. But in order to do it, you have to take huge risks. And from uh, Anders, from your position when you invest, when you look at companies, how do you deal with risk, reward, high risk, great reward, or do you kind of look at it in a different way? Yeah. You want to bet high, go for moonshots, or play safe? safer? I mean, we have an internal rate of return that we have set, uh, but as we invest our own capital only, we can take, I mean, our due diligence, it can, it has been taken everything from five minutes to three years. Uh, so it's, and it's, yeah, I mean, the risk reward, of course, has to be um, good, but um, it's, um, Would you rather do a reformulation substance compared to a gene therapy? Yes, I guess I would say so, or at least I have more more than one gene uh, therapy portfolio in our in our between in within our holdings. Yeah, and uh, from uh, from Katie's perspective, risk reward. Uh, do you take do you do you take big bets in that uh, to some extent? I mean, in terms of innovation and technical, you know, risks or, or yes, but there are different types of risks, right? You can put a very big bet and kind of um, own a big share of a com company or you can take a smaller 
bet or a smaller share of that company. So there are different types of, of risks that you can take. Um, but yes, we, we want to have very innovative companies in our portfolio. So we do not have um, reformulation companies in our portfolio at the moment. Can you somehow summarize when a company should really consider your investments? When when would I go to you? What type of company? In what stage would I be in? How innovative should I be? High risk, reward? When is the best shot for me to win your, your investment? Uh, if you're a pharma company, when you have done your regulatory toxicology, uh, you know, studies and are prepared to go into your first uh, phase one clinical trial, that's a great timing for us. If you have a first-in-class type of uh, molecule and, and uh, you know, yeah, uh, we are quite open to different indications so we don't specifically, you know, focus only on one. Um, also, our, our last investment was in a cell therapy uh, company. So um, that's great. If you are in med tech, then, you know, like Anders, we like to see that all regulatory approvals are in place and that there is some type of commercial validation. Uh, but then you can come to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I, I really I don't really understand or really the the definition of risk in terms of should it be reformulation or first class risks in investing is about understanding what you're doing. Uh, the main risk is that you sort of you don't know what risks there are. If there are calculated risks, you are aware of them. Uh, so I would say for us, it's uh, really about we want to understand the businesses on stock picking level. It's not we are not we are not not really concerned about okay this is reformulation or this is doing something similar but in a sort of more fashioned way. Uh, I mean it could be if it is. If it is a new market, we don't really want to bet on new market and new technology. Then it could be better. Okay, it's the existing technology that they take to a new market. So, um, uh, really, but we really try to. Where we have made mistakes, and it uh, in investing, it has come to two things basically. We misunderstood the people aspect and execution, and we didn't fully understand what we were invested, what we invested into. Uh, so that's my definition of, of uh, risk. Um, and yeah. Just to add to that, I, I, I think you have a very valid point that, you know, reformulation can be very innovative as well, uh, although we don't particularly go, go into that right now, but you can have very advanced technologies that, you know, still enable some type of uh, reformulation, so it, it can still be you know, higher risk or... And Christy, from your current engagement with Wint and Oblique, have you, what type of difficulties have you seen trying to fund these companies? Oh, it, it's very easy. You know, you come to investors and they, uh, you, you tell them what you have and they say, yes, but we would like to see this and this and this and so on. can be a bit frustrating and, you know. Uh, and also, uh, the more you get to see, the more expensive the program becomes. That's the problem, you know. Uh, we, we, when you are approaching proof of concept and, and you actually succeed with it, the price of the, the, the project goes up exponentially. So instead of perhaps of going for that type, you could go for a more earlier stage. And perhaps you could have some influence over how it's be, being run because what, what you pointed out here, uh, innovation is not enough. You need what we call operational excellence as well. And that can be, I've seen that being a challenge in many, many cases. But you need these two. 